All right, so <clears throat> the spring force is simply the force exerted by a spring. So uh, as you can see in this diagram, uh, you have a spring and uh, suppose you stretch the end of the spring as is shown in this diagram. So the end of the spring is stretched by an amount delta x right here. So you know that you know what's going to happen. So when you stretch the spring out by an amount delta x, then the spring will pull back to the left, right? So there will be a force to the left, which is indicated by this red arrow in the diagram. And sometimes this force is called the restoring force because it's basically just trying to restore the force, uh, restore the spring back to the way it was unstretched. Um, Hooke's law tells us that the restoring force exerted by a spring is directly proportional to the amount of stretch and is directed opposite to the stretch. So we know that it's directed opposite, opposite to the stretch. Uh, you pull the spring out to the right, the restoring force is to the left. So that part is fine. But Hooke did some experiments on, the, on springs a long time ago, and he concluded that the force exerted by the spring is directly proportional to the amount that the spring has been stretched. Uh, delta x is the amount that the spring has been stretched. So um, the constant of proportionality is k, and this k is sometimes called, uh, not sometimes, it's always called the spring constant. Okay, and what does this minus tell us? It, it just tells us that the force and the stretch are in opposite directions. Now, the same thing would have happened if you had squeezed the spring. So uh, suppose you have a spring like this, and the equilibrium position of the end of the spring is right here. So this is where the spring would be if you just leave it to itself. And, and the spring, of course, is sitting on a frictionless surface. So suppose you were to um, push the end of the spring from here to here. So you push it back all the way over here. Now this distance is delta x. So the spring will not be happy to be uh, squeezed, and so it would try to get back to its equilibrium position. So now the restoring force would be in this direction. So as you can see, if the stretch, uh, I mean, in the com compression in this case, uh, the delta x stands for the compression of the spring. If that is to the left, then the force will be to the right. And the negative sign in Hooke's law simply accounts for that, that the force, the restoring force and the stretch or the compression are in opposite directions. Okay, so that is Hooke's law. It just tells you that the force, uh, restoring force exerted by a spring is directly proportional to the amount that the spring is stretched or compressed and is directed opposite to the direction of the stretch or the compression. Okay, sometimes um, Hooke's law is written like this. Uh, it's very convenient to, so, so in this diagram you can see that x equals 0 has been set over here, right? Um, that is usually not the most convenient place to set x equals 0. It's much more convenient if you set x equals 0 to be somewhere over to be this point. So you this is the equilibrium position of the right end of the spring. So this point is a great place to set x equals 0, right? So suppose you stretch this spring out. So it's the same spring. I'm just drawing it again in a stretched condition. Suppose you stretch the spring out so that now the end is at x, right? So initially, the end was at x equals 0. And now, after stretching it, the end is at x. So in that case, delta x is just the change in x. So that's x minus x0, x minus 0, which is, which is just x, right? So if you assume that the equilibrium position of the end of the spring was at the origin, then Hooke's law can be written in a slightly more simple form. So f is equal to minus kx. And x here uh, represents the, uh, the stretch of the spring. Um, since the initial location of the end of the spring was 0, uh, x simply represents the stretch of the spring. So this is the form in which you usually see Hooke's law. But it's very important to remember that 
Hooke's law says that the restoring force is proportional to the amount that the spring has been stretched. So the general form should be f is equal to minus k delta x, uh, but it's we just simplify things by um, assuming that the origin lies at x equals uh, the the unstretched uh, position of the end of the spring is at the origin, and that allows us to get rid of this delta and just write f is equal to minus kx. All right. So that is uh, Hooke's law. All right. So let's do a couple of calculations uh, using Hooke's law. All right. So we are first going to calculate this result. So what is this telling us? It's saying that you have a certain spring, right? And the end of the spring, the, the un, if you leave the spring to itself, the end, uh, this is the unstretched condition of the spring. And where the end of the spring would, would be in that case, we are calling it x equals zero. So the equilibrium um, location of the end of the free end of the spring is x equals zero, right? All right, now this spring, is already stretched out. So here is the x equals zero, and I'm dra drawing the same spring. Uh, it would be it would make the diagram very cluttered if I draw drew them on top of one another. So uh, this is still this is x equals zero. So this particular spring is initially at x equals xi. The free end of the spring is at x equals xi. All right. So this is the initial condition, and then you stretch the spring out a little more until the free end of the spring is at x equals xf. All right, so you basically stretch the spring from x, the end of the spring from x equals xi to x equals xf. Um, what you have to find out is what is the work done by the spring force? which is the restoring for the work done by the restoring force. All right, now let's think about what uh, what sign the work would have. This, can, you, can you tell me what sign the work should have uh, without doing any calculations? Well, the spring force is always pulling to the right, right? So the spring force is always pulling to the right, I mean, sorry, to the left. So the restoring force is always to the left because the spring has been stretched out, right? So the restoring, it's trying to come back to its equilibrium position. And so while you were in the process of stretching the spring from Xi to Xf, you, con you continually encountered this left pointing restoring force of the spring, right? So the end of the spring was displaced to the right, whereas the force of the spring was always pointed to the left. So Based on that, can you tell me whether the work should be positive or negative? The correct answer is the work should be negative because the spring force did not get its way. On the other hand, you applied a force with your hand when you pulled the spring. So this was the external force. And so your force got its way. And so you did positive work, the external agent you did positive work whereas the spring did negative work. Okay, so we're gonna calculate the first, in the first part of this problem, we're gonna calculate the work done by the spring force, and then we're gonna calculate the work done by uh, the external agent. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so let's calculate the work done by the spring force first. Okay, so let's write down the force. The spring force is in general given by minus k x and I'm using this form of Hooke's law because I know that uh, the, the equilibrium position of the free end is x equals zero. So as we saw in the last slide, uh, if, if you assume that the equilibrium position of the free end is at the origin, then you can write uh, Hooke's law in this slightly more simple form. You don't have to put in the um, uh, put in uh, delta x because x and delta x become the same thing. All right, so that is the spring force. Uh, 
and the work done and and this is clearly a variable force uh, because it's proportional to x so the work done is going to be we we already know how to calculate the work done by a one dimensional variable force so we have discussed that earlier and it's right here so for a one dimensional variable force uh, and as we have seen in class uh, the work is simply the integral of the force um, the integral is evaluated between the starting position and the ending position right so this follows from the more general line integral formulation and uh, and i showed you how this is just a special case of what we get uh, when uh, from line integrals uh, so just specialized to one dimension so we'll just use this result so the work done is going to be integral f dx from the starting position to the ending position the starting position is x equals xi the ending position is x equals xf right so all we have to do is just work this integral out so it's just going to be minus kx um, integral of minus kx x initial to x final dx and that is the work done and that will just be if you uh, pull out the minus k which is a constant uh, you are just integrating x from x initial to x final so you get minus k um, over 2 uh, x final square minus x initial square all right so that's the answer so this is the work done by the spring force as you were stretching the spring out from x initial to x final now let's just make sure we we uh, argued in the beginning without doing any uh, calculations we we deduced that the work should have a negative sign let's just confirm that this quantity has a negative sign is overall a negative quantity you know that xf is greater than xi right um, you can see that right i mean it's obvious from uh, the diagram you stretched out the spring from initial stretch xi to a greater stretch xf so xf is larger than xi obviously so xf square minus xi square is a positive number k is a positive number and so uh, the um, quantity uh, and since because of the minus sign you have uh, overall uh, this is a negative quantity just as you would have expected So the work done by the spring is negative, and that is uh, that completely makes sense because the spring force in this situation did not get its way. All right, now let's do let's think about the second part. What is the work done by the external force that's stretching the spring? So the external force, let's call that F external. And the red one is uh, this fs the force exerted by the spring now in order to calculate the work done by the external force we need to know what the external force is right um, in in this problem on the slide we are told that the external force that the spring is stretched with zero acceleration right so what does that tell, tell us so the end of the spring does not have any acceleration if the acceleration is zero we know from chapter four and five that the net force must be zero right so the acceleration of the end of the spring was zero so that means the net force acting on the end of the spring was um, must be uh, zero so that tells you that the external force is always equal to the spring force remember that the spring force is not constant the spring force is dependent on x right but the external force is always just matching the spring force. So you're basically pulling the spring in such a way that uh, you are matching the force exerted by the spring, right? So since, so this is the second part. So since uh, the end of the spring has no acceleration and that's given in the problem has no acceleration um, we can conclude that the net force on it must be zero 
So Fs must be equal to F external. So the net force, and that's because the net force uh, on the end of the spring must be zero, right? The only difference between F, so Fs and Fx have the same magnitude, but obviously they're in opposite directions. So the external force was obviously to the right and the spring force is to the left. So in calculating the work, um, so now you can just, you have all the information you need to calculate the work done by the external agent. So the work done by the external agent is integral F external dx. I'm using the same formula for uh, the work uh, using a one dimensional variable uh, for a one dimensional force x initial to x final and what will f external be so f external will simply be uh, kx uh, without the negative sign because it's just always has the same magnitude as the spring force but it's pointed in the opposite direction so it will just be kx dx x initial to x final and so you can see that the work done by the external agent in this case is going to be exactly what we had earlier without the minus sign. So it's just going to be positive k over 2 x final square minus x initial square. And that is the work done by the external agent. All right. Now, the last part of the question is asking how much work is done by the spring if the end of the spring were stretched from its equilibrium position out to a distance x. So we can just use the, the result that we just derived. The work done by the spring, when it's stretched from xi to xf, turns out to be minus, I'm just copying the result from the first part, x final square minus x initial square. So in the third part of the problem, we are just being uh, told that x initial is zero and x final is x. So the spring was just stretched from its equilibrium position uh, out to a distance x. And so what is the work done? The work done by the spring in that case will simply be minus half k x squared. This result is actually quite useful. And uh, because usually when you stretch a spring, you start from the equilibrium position. That's usually the case. You don't have to. But in almost all applications, that's what en ends up happening. So uh, you'll see this, uh, this result uh, often. Um, so the work done by the spring when you stretch it from its equilibrium position is minus half k x squared. All right, okay. So the next slide has, uh, I mean the next slide after the one that we just did. So this is a, this is, um, uh, an example where you apply the result that we just derived in the previous slide. So I'll let you try that on your own. All right. So we are done with calculating work for um, a variety of different situations. We have seen work done, how to calculate the work done by a constant force. We have seen how to calculate the work done by a far more general uh, vector field where the force is varying in magnitude and direction uh, along the entire path and the object is also not moving in a straight line. So we've seen how you can calculate the work in those cases using a line integral. And then we also looked at the special case of when the force is variable, but uh, the object is moving in a straight line. So everything is in one dimension, but the force is variable. So we saw that that case we can also do easily using what we learned from line integrals. Okay, so now let's move on to a different topic and that is going to be kinetic energy. All right, so what is kinetic energy? Now, you know that anything that's moving has energy. So an object that's in motion has more energy than an identical object that's at rest. So kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion, right? Kinetic energy uh, depends on the mass of the object because the more mass it has, the more uh, kinetic energy it's going to have. And it also depends on how fast the object is moving, the speed of the object. The actual formula for kinetic energy is this one right here. The symbol for kinetic energy usually is capital K. 
And so the formula for kinetic energy is half mv squared. So you can see that it depends on both mass and velocity. And it depends very strongly on the velocity. So um, if you increase the velocity, the kinetic energy increases very rapidly. The unit of kinetic energy is a joule, just like the unit of work. And we, we will see that work and energy are pretty much the same thing. Um, so they have the same units. And obviously, uh, ener kinetic energy, like any other energy, is a scalar quantity. All right, so that is kinetic energy. The next thing that we are going to learn is the work kinetic energy theorem. So this is a very, very important result. Uh, the work kinetic energy theorem tells you that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. So this theorem is saying that there is a direct relationship between work done on an object and how its kinetic energy changes. And the relationship is this, that the net amount of work done by all forces acting on an object is equal to the change of kinetic energy of the object. So you can write that compactly like this, that net work is equal to delta K. So please uh, make sure you're, under, you're clear about what network is. We, I, I had spent a little bit of time in the lecture talking about network. Network simply means that the work, so if there's a bunch of different forces acting on the object, you can go ahead and calculate the work done by all of these forces, right? But work is a scalar. So the network is simply the total amount of work done uh, on the object. So to calculate the network, you would simply add up the amounts of work done by all the different forces. That would be the network. So the work energy theorem says that the network is simply equal to the change of kinetic energy. All right, so this theorem has, uh, this little result has many, many applications. Um, this application uh, is here's one simple demonstration of the work kinetic energy theorem. Uh, I would have asked you to do this, uh, if I were teaching a lecture in class, uh, I would have asked you to do this at home. But since I'm making a video, I, I might as well just uh, work through it. Uh, but I would recommend that you give this a try yourself first before you see how I do it. So feel free to pause the video and work through these steps here. And um, if you have trouble, then only then you, you can resume the video and, and see how I do it. All right, so let me pull this up. So here in this example, we have a car that, that has a mass M uh, that's moving in a straight horizontal road. At a certain instant of time, the driver steps on the gas pedal and uh, the, the speed of the car increases from V initial to V final over a distance D. So the car is initially over here and it goes from here to here. And its speed has increased from, so its velocity over here was V initial, velocity over here is V final, right? Um, and its velocity has increased. Okay, and, and this change in velocity happens over a distance d. So we're going to call this distance as d. Okay, and to make things simple, we have assumed that all forces are constant, though that, that, that assumption is not necessary. You can, you can, you'll get the same result if you, even if you don't make that assumption. But we're just going to assume that all forces are constant. So that allows us to use kinematics. All right. OK, so let's look at what the first part of the, the problem is asking. It's saying, what calculate the acceleration of the car, acceleration A of the car using kinematics. So this is a simple kinematics problem. Uh, you can take x initial to be 0 x final to be x or some x final would be d in that case. Which kinematic equation can I use to find the acceleration? It looks like uh, the third kinematic equation would be great. So let's write down the third kinematic equation. v final square equals v initial square plus 2a x final minus x initial. Um, so 
v square is equal to v0 square plus 2aa is what I'm trying to solve for. Uh, x final minus x initial is simply d. And so now I can just solve for a. So the acceleration of the car is going to be v square minus v initial square divided by 2a, uh, divided by 2d. So that's the acceleration of the car, right? And that's that answers the first part. All right, calculate the net force on the car using Newton's second law. So we've already found the acceleration of the car, right? Um, and so we want to find the net force on the car. So net force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So the net force on the car is simply going to be m multiplied by the acceleration that we just got, v square minus v0 square divided by 2d. And that's it. So that's the net force on the car. All right. So if we know what the net force is, we can also calculate the net work on the car because uh, the net work is simply the work done by the net force, right? So to calculate net work, you can individually calculate the work done by all the forces or alternatively you can calculate the net force and just find the work done by the net force both of these will give you the same thing so the net work is simply going to be the net force multiplied by we i'm just using the formula for work here uh, what is the direction of the net force since the object is accelerating to the right the f net will be to the right F net is just the vector sum of the forward force uh, of the engine and the backward force of drag. So F net will be to the right. So you get W net is equal to F net multiplied by uh, distance multiplied by cosine of the angle between the F net and the distance. But here F net is to the right, the distance, the displacement is to the right. And so the angle between them is zero. So cosine of zero. Right, so what does that come to? Uh, it, it's just F net multiplied by D. So let's plug in F net. So this was the second part, and this was the first part. Let's let's uh, plug in F net. So we get m v squared minus v zero squared divided by two D multiplied by D, and that's net work. And the D cancels out, and look at this. This simplifies to half m v squared minus half mv initial square. So what we, what did we just get here? We saw that net work equals uh, k final minus k initial, because th this is the formula for k, half mv square, which is delta k. And so we have demonstrated that the work kinetic energy theorem holds in this case using uh, our knowledge of kinematics and Newton's laws. Like we've shown that the work kinetic energy theorem holds. All right, okay. So that's one demonstration that it holds. Uh, I have a couple of problems on the work kinetic energy theorem in the PowerPoint over here. This one is fully worked out. So uh, you can try this on your own. This problem we had done in class using Newton's second law and um, using Newton's second law and um, kinematics. And it was not, uh, I mean, we were ultimately able to do it, but it was not uh, a particularly, uh, it was not particularly simple in the sense that we had to just do multiple steps in order to get the answer, right? So we first started out using the work formula and then we needed to figure out the force uh, on the dumbbell, uh, on the barbell, so we had to calculate the, um, apply Newton's second law and find the force, and then we also needed acceleration uh, in order to calculate the force, so we did a kinematics calculation to find the acceleration, and so we did all these steps, and eventually we got to the answer, but uh, let's try this problem using just the work kinetic energy theorem, right? So what's happening in this problem? Oops. So you have the barbell, which is initially at a certain height, right? And then the barbell is lowered to the ground. Its initial velocity 
was zero and its final velocity is v. So its initial velocity is zero and its final velocity is v. All right, and we know the distance that it's lowered by. We know that it's lowered by a distance. Uh, let's call that distance d. All right, and uh, the question asked, ultimately the question asked, what was the work done by the power lifter while lowering the bar, right? So that's what we calculated earlier when we did this problem using Newton's laws and kinematics. All right, so let's follow the steps uh, outlined in, in this slide. So the first thing that's, that's being asked is what is the net work done on the barbell while it was being lowered to the ground? So there are two forces acting on the barbell as, as we had seen earlier. So there is the force of exerted by the power lifter uh, and the force of gravity on the barbell, mg. So these are the two forces acting on the barbell. So the first thing that this question is asking us is what is the net work done on the barbell by these two forces? So let's just directly apply the work kinetic energy theorem. Net work equals the change of kinetic energy. So this will just be final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. And so this will be uh, half mv square minus half mv initial square. But v initial is zero. So it's just going to be half mv square. So the net work done by, um, uh, by both the forces uh, is very easy to calculate. It's just going to be 1 half multiplied by 167 multiplied by um, the final velocity squared, 2 squared. Uh, let's just calculate that. Um, all right, so I don't have a calculator in front of me. I'll just do it on, on the computer. So um, 0.5 times 167 uh, times 4 and oops wait a second so 0. 0.5 uh, times 167 times 4 so that's 334 joules is the net work done uh, on the barbell in the process of being lowered. Okay, the second question is asking, what is the work done by gravity? So the work done by gravity is going to be, uh, it's easy to calculate because the gravitational force is constant, right? So the gravitational force is going, uh, is, is just mg, right? Uh, and it's a constant force. We know the distance, the object is moving in a straight line. So we can just use the simple formula for work. To remind you, the simple formula for work applies when the force, when A, the force is constant and B, the object is moving in a straight line, right? Both of those conditions are true. So we can, we can, uh, we can just use that. So um, it's going to be mg multiplied by D, multiplied by the, angle between mg and d. mg is pointed downwards. The displacement is also downwards. And so that's going to be cosine of 0, which is 1. So it's going to be mg multiplied by d. Uh, that is the work done by gravity. Let's go ahead and calculate that. 167 times 9.8 times uh, the displacement was uh, 0.85. OK, let's see what, what that comes to. 167 times 9.8 times 0.85. So that's 1391.11 joules. All right. So that is the work done by uh, gravity. Now let's calculate what is the work done by the power lifter. So this is what we had calculated in the earlier version of this problem. That's what, that's what our goal was, to calculate the work done by the power lifter. So now, how do we get that? We know that the network, so this is what we're looking for. So how do we find it? We know, we know that, what is the network? The network is simply the work done by all the forces, right? So that's gonna be the work done by uh, the power lifter plus the work done by gravity, right? 
that is the network by definition. It's just this algebraic sum of the work done by all the forces. So from here, we can solve for the work done by the power lifter. It's just going to be the network minus the work done by gravity. And these two, we already calculated very easily. So the network was 334 joules. And the work done by gravity was uh, 1391.11 joules. And so if you uh, subtract these, then what do we get? So 334 minus 1391. I'll, I'll ignore the point 11. So it, it comes to minus 1057 joules. And that's exactly what we got when we did this problem earlier uh, using Newton's laws. But here you can see how ridiculously easy it is. We did, we did, did three very simple calculations. We calculated the network using the change of kinetic energy, work kinetic energy theorem. We were easily able to calculate the work done due to gravity because we know what the gravitational force is. We know what the displacement is. And so that was no problem, calculating the work done by gravity. And then we just use the fact that the network is simply the sum of these two, work done by the power lifter and work done by gravity, and solve for the work done by the power lifter, and we got the answer. Right? Okay, so you can see that energy techniques are in general much simpler than trying to use Newton's laws or uh, kinematics, Newton's laws and kinematics. So you can do problems using Newton's laws and kinematics, but usually that's not the easiest way to do a problem. In general, in energy techniques are far simpler uh, in doing problems than using Newton's laws. Okay. All right, so let's do another example. A simple pendulum, so that, that's the problem on the next slide. And once again, uh, please pause the video here, take a good look at this problem and see if you can solve it yourself and only then um, watch the video. All right. So there are multiple ways of solving this problem, but we are just going to use the work kinetic energy theorem right now. In, as we progress further in this chapter, you will see that the work kinetic energy theorem is also not the easiest way to solve a problem. There's, uh, there is another method, which uh, is the same thing as the work kinetic energy theorem, but just makes it a little easier to apply. Uh, we are gonna learn that at the end uh, of this chapter, but for now, we are just going to, um, use the work kinetic energy theorem. All right, so uh, what's going on in this problem? Oops. You have a simple pendulum, which consists of a point mass, uh, bob, the mass of which is m, and a massless string of length l, which is hanging vertically. Okay, so this is what the pendulum looks like to begin with. Then the bob is given an initial horizontal velocity, which means that you give it a whack and uh, uh, hit it and make it move sideways. So you give it a horizontal velocity V0. And as a result of that, it rises up uh, to somewhere over here. So it follows, we are, we are assuming that the string stays taut and it follows a circular path and rises up over there. Okay, so the question is how high is it gonna rise? So this was the original height and that's the final height. Uh, and so you want to find the difference in heights. H is what you're interested in. Okay, so how do we do this? What you can do is, yeah, so, so we're going to try to use the work kinetic energy theorem. The work kinetic energy theorem says that the net work done equals the change in kinetic energy. That's the work kinetic energy theorem, right? Okay, let's do the change in kinetic energy part first because that's easy. So the velocity at the bottom was V initial, right? What is the velocity when it gets to uh, the highest point uh, or, or the speed? Uh, the speed is zero because it momentarily deposits there. So the final velocity is zero, right? So the change of kinetic energy is half, uh, final kinetic energy is zero, Initial kinetic energy is half m v initial square, right? So the delta k is just minus half m v, v initial square. That's the right-hand side of the work kinetic energy theorem. 
All right. Okay, now let's calculate the left hand side of this. So net work is simply the work done by all the forces that are acting on the uh, on the mass, right? So what are the forces that are acting on the mass? So at any time, there is there are two forces acting on the mass. One of them is one of them is the force of gravity. Let me just draw in, draw the draw it at an intermediate position over here. So at uh, one of the forces is the force of gravity, which is acting straight down. What's the other force that's acting on the bob? That is the force of tension. So these are the only two real physical forces which are acting on the bob of the pendulum, right? So the work, the net work would simply be the work done by the tension plus the work done by gravity, right? So that would be the net work. Now, does tension do any work? Think about this for a moment and think about a top hat question that we had done uh, when we first started talking about work. So we had seen in that top hat example that so that top hat example involved uh, a bo uh, an object that was attached to a string and the string was whirled around in a horizontal circle. And the question was, what was the work done by tension? And we had discussed that tension does not do any work. Why? because the tension is directed radially inwards, right? And if you're considering the motion of the particle, and if you just break it up into tiny little segments, each tiny segment is directed tangential to the circle, right? So the radial direction and the tangential directions are always perpendicular. So as a result of that, the uh, net work done, uh, the work done by the tension over each infinitesimal step along the circle is going to be zero. So the tension does not do any work. So work done by tension is zero. Right? Okay, and this was discussed when we um, did the top hat example a while ago. All right, now what about the work done by gravity? So to calculate the work done by gravity, the gravitational force is constant, it's always mg, but uh, the object is not following a straight line path, right? The object is following this curved path. So we are not quite sure how we can calculate the work done by gravity in this case, because the object is not following a straight line path. It looks like we'll have to do a line integral to calculate the work done by gravity, right? However, there is a nice trick that you can use here in, in order to calculate the work done by gravity, which is as follows. So basically our problem is that our object moved from I'm drawing a separate diagram because the other one got quite cluttered. Our object moved from here to here along a curved path, right? Circle, um, arc of a circle. Now, we don't really know how we can calculate this uh, line integral. I mean, it is possible to do this as a line integral, but uh, we are not gonna bother with that. We are gonna use a little trick in order to calculate the work done by gravity we know what kind of force is the gravitational force. The gravitational force is a conservative force. So gravity is a conservative force. So that means that the work done by gravity does not depend on the path that you take in going from the starting point to the ending point. It only depends on where the starting point is and where the ending point is. <coughs> Excuse me. It does not depend on the path followed by the particle in going from the starting to the ending point. So instead of using this actual curved path that the particle is following, we could replace that by a fictitious path that's like this. And the advantage of this fictitious path is that we do know how to calculate the work done on this kind of path, but we just don't know how to calculate the work done on this arc of a circle, right? So since the uh, 
amount of work that you will get does not depend on which path you're following, uh, which path you're using to calculate it. That's, that's the definition of a conservative force. We can just calculate the work done uh, by gravity if the object had somehow followed this green, uh, this green path, the green dashed path, right? So let's label these points A, B, and C, or A, C, and B. And let's calculate the work done by gravity as the particle goes from A to C. So what is the work done by gravity? So what we're doing is, let me just write this down. So we, uh, so that means, this means that uh, the work done by gravity, by gravity, may be calculated using any path. It does not matter whether that's the path that the particle actually followed. So choose the simple, simpler path ACB, right? So we are going to use, we are going to calculate the work done by gravity along this simpler path ACB. So work done by gravity that then just becomes the work done along AC, work done by gravity along AC, plus the work done by gravity along CB, right? What is the work done by gravity along AC? So clearly gravity, the force of gravity is pointed downwards always, and it's constant. So along AC, does, do you do any work at all? Does gravity do any work at all along AC? The answer is no, because the displacement AC is perpendicular to the direction of gravity. So there is no work done along AC. What about along CB? So C to B, uh, the object is moving upwards and gravity is directed downwards. So that, that would be some negative work. So let's calculate that. Um, the work done as the particle goes from C to B in the fictitious path is just going to be mass of the particle. Stick with black here. Mass of the particle, I mean uh, mg, which is the gravitational force. The displacement is just CB, which is the height that we are interested in finding. So that's just the same height, H, multiplied by uh, cosine of the angle between the displacement and the gravitational force, uh, which in this case is 180 degrees because gravity is downwards and the displacement is upwards. So it's just going to be minus mgh, right? So we have finally calculated the work done by gravity. The calculation itself was very simple, but uh, since the conceptual, um, uh, the conceptual reasoning behind the calculation uh, is probably new to most of you. I, I just broke it down uh, and that's why it took, took us a little bit of time to get there. But as you can see, the work done by gravity just comes to minus mgh, right? And, um, and just to summarize, we calculated this using the fact that we are allowed to calculate the work along any path joining the starting point and the ending point. So we just picked a simple path for ourselves the actual particle obviously followed the curve. It did not follow our green dashed path, but the green dashed path made it very easy to calculate the work. And it helped us avoid uh, having to do a, an actual line integral. However, if you wanted to do an honest to God line integral along the curve, you could have done that and it would have given you the same answer. All right, so let's finish this. So minus mgh is equal to minus half mv zero squared. That is, uh, that is what we're getting from the work kinetic energy theorem. And we are pretty much done. I'll just write it over here. So the work kinetic energy theorem, net, uh, net work equals the change of kinetic energy, ultimately gave us minus half mv initial square for the delta k. And the net work came to minus mgh. And now you can just go ahead and solve for h. So h comes to v0 square divided by 2g. And that's the final answer. All right. So this problem um, shows you how you can apply the work kinetic energy theorem. And it also shows you this trick that I use to calculate the work done, which is since gravity is a conservative force, I don't necessarily have to use the path 
actually followed by the particle uh, when there is a conservative force. Uh, if there is an easier path that would allow me to calculate the work more simply, I can just choose that simpler path. So that's that's what we did here. Okay. We are now going to do a, a not one more problem uh, involving the work kinetic energy theorem. And that is the problem on this slide. So an object of mass m moves along the x-axis under the influence of a force, which is given by minus kx. So it it's, looks like it's just the spring force again. And uh, it starts from rest uh, from the position x equals a. Find its speed at position some other x, any, any other x. And the answer has to be expressed in terms of k, a, x, and any appropriate constants. So this is an important problem. So please make sure you understand this. And once again, I would recommend pausing the video and giving this problem a try yourself. In fact, in class, uh, I assigned this as a top hat question. So, um, so please make sure that you give this a try um, before watching the video. All right. So let's see how we would do this problem. So the problem is saying that you have a particle which is always feeling a force uh, given by f is equal to minus kx. All right, what is the real physical situation that this is describing? That, that will probably make it a little easier for you to visualize this. So just imagine that the mass is connected to a spring which is stretched out, right? And let's say that this, this is where the end of the, sp uh, the spring would like to be uh, if you had left the spring alone. So the mass would have been over here and we're setting the origin uh, over here. So we're calling this x equals zero. This is the equilibrium position. That just means that if you were not touching the system, if you just left it to itself, the spring would be unstretched and the mass would just happily sit at x equals zero. All right, so we are setting the origin at the equilibrium position. So, but now we have stretched out the spring to x equals a. So the mass is currently at x equals a. Then you just let it go. So what is the uh, speed um, going to be at some other x is what we are trying to figure out here, right? So we know that the speed at x equals a was zero. That was given in the problem. So we want to find out what is the speed going to be at some other at some other x. So maybe when you let it go, uh, when it's somewhere over here, what is its speed going to be at that point? Or when it's back to x equals zero, what is its speed going to be at that point? So that's what we have to figure out, right? Okay. So um, let's let's just try our standard Newton's second law approach. F is equal to minus kx. So we know the force. There's only one force in the horizontal direction acting on this mass. So I can calculate the acceleration. So the acceleration of the mass is equal to F divided by m using Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, and so that's going to be minus k over m times x. Right? So that's, that's going to be the acceleration. Right now, the question is asking for the velocity. Is this a constant acceleration? It's not a constant acceleration because clearly the acceleration depends on position, so it's not constant. So that means kinematics is not applicable here at all. Um, so what we can do, what we usually do when we can't use kinematics, is we just go back to the definitions of velocity and acceleration, and use the fact that velocity is the integral of acceleration. Right. So the velocity would just be the integral of the acceleration dt. So that would be integral minus k over m x dt. All right, now can I do this integral? The answer is you cannot do this integral. And why not? Because of variable mismatch. So we have to know what is the x as a function of time. And unless we know that, we can't integrate this we can't integrate it with respect to the variable t, right? So we have this variable mismatch now, and so we are unable to integrate uh, this. And so that means this approach has 
uh, come to a halt and we are stuck. So what do we do? Now, it's not impossible to get out of this problem. So if you really know your calculus well, there are tricks that you can use to, to get out of this problem. But let's, uh, but we have a far more powerful tool in our hands right now, which is the work kinetic energy theorem. So let's see if we can do something with that. So we're just gonna leave this approach for now and resume the problem using the work kinetic energy theorem. I mean, restart the problem using the work kinetic energy theorem. Okay. Please make sure you understand why we got stuck because this approach that we are using over here is what we used throughout the beginning of this course. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, uh, there's nothing wrong with this approach. It's based on the fact that the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. So the velocity is obviously the antiderivative of the acceleration. And so if you have an acceleration, you can in general integrate it to find the velocity. But the only problem here is that the acceleration is not specified as a function of time. So you cannot integrate it with respect to t, which is what you need to do uh, in this particular case, because we don't know how um, x, the acceleration has an x in it, and we don't know how the x varies with time. All right, so let's see what we can, uh, let's give this a try using a different approach. So let's try the work kinetic energy theorem. The work kinetic energy theorem says that the network equals the change of kinetic energy, right? Now there is only one force here, um, which is the force of the spring. All right, so um, let's start with the right-hand side of the work kinetic energy theorem. Uh, so the object has moved from, let's, let's say it's moved from x equals a to x equals some x, some genetic x. So I'll just draw that, draw the position of the object, the new position of the object somewhere over here. The object is over here, let's say, some generic x. And uh, we want to know what is its velocity. That's what the problem question is asking. So what is the change in kinetic energy of the object? The change in kinetic energy would be final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. So let's say that its velocity is V. So it would be half mv squared minus its initial kinetic energy at x equals a. So it was at rest at x equals a. So its initial kinetic energy was zero. So we're getting w net is equal to half mv squared, right? All right, now I need to find out what is the work done by the net force, which is f, just the f, f is the only force acting on it. So what is the work done by the spring force in, move, in uh, moving the object from x equals a to x, right? So I can just use the formula for work done by a one, one dimensional force. And so, anyway, so I'll just move this over here. Uh, so what we have so far is W net is equal to half mv squared. And uh, we are just calculating the W net. So that's the work done by the spring force. So it's just gonna be integral minus kx dx. You know that in one dimension, you just integrate the force uh, to get the work. And um, the initial position is x, uh, initial position was x equals a, final position is just some x, right, generic x. I'll just get rid of this x equals a, oops. So we are in, the limits of integration are a to x because the object started at a and moved to x. All right, so, half mv square, we can easily do this integral. So minus k, and then this becomes x squared divided by two. And then you plug in the limits. So you get minus k over two, x squared minus a squared is equal to one half mv square. All right, and we are done. So now we found the velocity at position x. Uh, and, and we are pretty much done. We can just rearrange this. We can uh, multiply through by the minus one and we can write the left-hand side as a square minus x square. So then we don't have the negative sign sticking outside. The two cancels out, so I don't need to worry about that. 
I can just divide both sides by M and the M will appear in the denominator. And then that, that'll be V square. And so V, the final answer is gonna be the square root of A square minus X square, right? All right, now, and that is the answer. So we were able to find the velocity of the particle at any position X. All right, now another question that I ask uh, when I put this on top hat uh, is the following. So I ask for this particular mass, uh, is it is the is the part is this mass completely unrestricted? Can it move anywhere, or is it restricted to move in a certain region? You can actually answer that. So the question is: Is the uh, object in this problem free to move anywhere on the x-axis or is it restricted in any way? You can actually answer this question just by looking at the result that we just derived. Right? Can you answer that question looking at this result? You don't even need to know what the physical situation is. Just by looking at this result, you can tell whether this particle can be at any x or is it restricted to certain values of x. The correct answer is that it is restricted to x. The correct answer is it's restricted to Uh, the region x lies between minus a and plus a. Can you see why? That is because you cannot allow x square to be greater than a square, right? Because then you'll, you're, you're going to have a negative quantity under the radical, which would um, make the velocity an imaginary quantity, which doesn't make any sense at all. So x squared has to always be less than a squared, which means that x has to lie between minus a and plus a, right? So the, our particle here can only uh, remain between x equals plus a on this side and x equals minus a on this side. That's the extent of how far it can travel. Uh, it cannot go. Uh, beyond that. And why is that? Um, physically, you can e easily understand why that is the case. So it cannot go beyond x equals a uh, plus a or x equals minus a because it's starting from x equals plus a, right? And so uh, it will, the force of the spring will bring it back to x equals zero. And it's not going to stop at x equals zero. It will already have a high velocity. And so even though the force is zero at x equals zero, it will push, keep going forward and now start squeezing the spring and go all the way up to x equals minus a, right? And uh, there uh, the spring will, uh, the, 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 the force due to the spring will be strong there and it will force the particle to turn around and the particle will just keep on, uh, the mass will just keep on oscillating between x equals minus a and x equals plus a. There is a name for this particular system. It's called the simple harmonic oscillator. And you will study it in a lot of detail in chapter 14. All right. Uh, but for now, this is just an application of the work kinetic energy theorem. All right. In fact, this formula will be very important in chapter 14. Uh, this formula for the velocity. This is the velocity of a simple harmonic oscillator. And we are going to derive it in a completely different way in chapter 14, which has absolutely nothing to do with this approach. Um, all right. Okay. So that's that. I have a similar problem on the next slide. So this is very, very similar to, to, the, to the one that we just discussed. So please make sure you do this one on your own. Okay, so I'll pause this video over here and I'll make another video where we cover a few more slides.